Just had a killer conversation with my uh, somewhat new friend, Bob Switzer. Bob Switzer has a podcast called The Epic Narrative. And uh, he is a storyteller and a man of God, a, a, a pastor who is in the current season of rediscovering what that looks like. Uh, I actually had to hit record. And every once in a while, this happens where we get going and we're just connecting. And, and he's so easy to talk to. Uh, we think very similar. Our stories echo each other. And so uh, he got going and he got uh, already sharing a little bit of, about something. And I was like, I got to hit record. So I, uh, I just do. I hit record. And I'm actually going to introduce us right in the middle of that thought because we come back around to it later. It's on deconstruction. But we talk about our journey. Bob shares his story, uh, his journey from uh, fundamentalism uh, to some extent uh, into the, this uh, this measureless grace, the liberty of love in which um, we can revisit all of our certainties in the context of of a, of, of a greater love that lays his life down that is reconciling all things uh, to himself. When we talk about hierarchy, uh, how our perspectives on who God is will impact how we do church, how we do ministry, how we do life. Uh, we, we dive into that a good bit. He breaks down Balaam in a way at the end that reveals how to uh, re-read scripture in the context of a Christocentric hermeneutic, the goodness of God as Jesus revealed it being our lens. Uh, we, we talk about, um, uh, well, all of the ways in which the church uh, has impacted our lives for good, even uh, in places where maybe there were some theological uh, or uh, some poor theology. Uh, this was an easy conversation. You're going to love Bob. He, he's he's a brilliant communicator. Uh, I, th I can't recommend his podcast enough, The Epic Narrative, uh, where he breaks down uh, uh, scripture. And he really, uh, the first season, he talks about David, the second season, the life of David, the second season, he starts in Genesis. Um, I think he's moving through season three and heading to season four, shares a little bit about that, but I can't recommend his podcast enough. I'm, I'm blown away by all of, all of the folks I continue to meet in these last several years who have been, uh, who've been pioneering at least in their own lives, language and understanding around the goodness of God. That isn't just a concept, but is actually, uh, something they have authority on because they've lived it. They've, they've laid their life down. They've put all their eggs in, in the basket of God's perfect love, his goodness. And Bob is another one of those people. And, 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 uh, I, I'm blessed to count, count him as a brother and I'm looking forward to this developing friendship. So I think this podcast is going to incredibly bless you. If you're, if you're looking for a podcast on how to approach scripture, uh, and this is, this is going to help you. If you're looking for a podcast that, um, uh, would break down some of the ways by which we have gotten uh, Sunday morning wrong, but without throwing the church under the bus, I think this will help you. And uh, I, I, I'm excited about uh, sharing it with you. Uh, appreciate being on this journey with you guys. Love what's happening. Uh, on the Facebook group, we're growing. Rethinking God with Tacos, you can join us there. Uh, that is a sweet community growing there. A lot of opportunity to process some of our journey as we awaken to his love. Thankful for uh, all those folks who partner with us in giving. We're listener supported. And I'm thankful for that. If you want to partner with us, you can go to a familystory.org. We're a nonprofit. You can give there. Uh, you can also join up for our mailing list, a familystory.org, and we'll keep you up to date on books and and Zoom calls uh, uh, that we, we do uh, for the sake of community and connection and teaching. And then also uh, we'll keep you up with a podcast. Uh, appreciate you guys. Appreciate being on this journey with you. This is my conversation with Bob Switzer. All right. Touch you guys. I won't, I'm good at editing, but I'm just like, I'm going to go ahead. <laughs> we've already started. I can tell. So we, um, like... <laughs> Anyways, I, I set up this like specific appointment. Right. And I, as you know, she's very sweet. She was a very sweet lady. She sits down with me. She goes, so why do you want to, like, why, why are we meeting? Like any pastor would ask, like, right. why, so why does the husband of my secretary administrator want to talk to me? And I'm like, you know, honestly, I, 
I've never met anybody who's a female pastor. <laughs> she starts laughing. She's like, I said, I know. Isn't that horrible? Right. I, I don't I can't, I can't even explain why other than yeah. I was just arrogant, thought I had all the answers. I, I don't, I don't know. Anyways, it was a sweet time. We got to, you know, be really good friends. And she introduced me to another thing that I had no idea existed, which was female theologians hey. that were, that were writing books <laughs> <laughs> like academically. <laughs> and I remember, uh, but the Over. first book I, I got was by a, a girl named, uh, well, she was an older lady, Phyllis Trickle or Triple. Okay. Trickle? Anyways, she wrote a thing on Jonah and what she called it was rhetorical, rhetorical, uh, criticism or rhetorical. Oh man. Now I shouldn't have started the story. I can't <laughs> bottom line is it, it was a theological approach to what I was doing which was the speaking from the narrative, right. not exegetical, but not that that's not a part of it. It's actually more intense because you yeah. have to get all that stuff down and then you have to tie it all together in, yeah. in the, in the yeah. story. Yeah. And I'm looking at this going, Oh my word, this is amazing. Like, this is what I do. I had no idea. It was, I had no idea anybody else did it, let alone that it's an actual study you can have in theology. Again, I came from such a conservative world right that there was no narrative preaching you had yeah. to do it exegesis you had to have three points you had to have yeah, yeah. you know everything in line you were allowed to have you know two illustrations but they couldn't be about yourself because it's not about you it's about god and it's about the word and uh, oh, i was so serious. good at that i was so good at it yeah. and yet it wasn't it wasn't me it wasn't me <laughs> oh anyway. and also women women can do this oh <laughs> And also, by the way, <laughs> that was that was the next thing that I learned from her was was that there are women in the Bible <laughs> and their perspective might have something to do with the way we should be interacting with the hey. scripture. Sheesh. Wow. So I remember I'll just I this is so funny to me now to recount this. I remember the first time getting that revelation, like it was some new thing, right? God yeah. told me there's girls in the Bible. <laughs> and, then, and then going back to Bathsheba. And I remember yeah. being so internally like passion came out of me. Like you, you have neglected the most righteous person in this story yeah. because because it's not, you know, it's about David or in, and I've been in sessions where somehow she, she bore some responsibility yeah. for being raped. I was, I was incensed. I didn't know. I was, I remember thinking, I don't even like, I'm going to preach this. I'm going to scream it from the mountaintops. But thankfully I was at a youth camp at the time for like eight years. And so deconstruction was very easy there because my theological working through things had nothing to do with my job as long as I recruited and trained and you know I took care of uh uh you know the morning chapels which again nobody cared what yeah. I did yeah so I was able to really figure out my life as a narrative preacher at that point but man I uh that was that was there you go there's a story <laughs> In the middle of my story. So, hey, guys, uh, I was, uh, Bob Switzer is with us. And uh, normally, you know, we get talking and sometimes I'll get a, I'll get a guest on and we get chit chat and we get to know each other. And I realized, oh, wait, the podcast has already started. <laughs> so I just hit record. The, the timing goes five, four, three. And I interrupt them for a second. And go, man, I'm, I'm we, we already started. We were talking about our journeys. We were talking about that, that word deconstruct deconstructing and those early days of rethinking and reforming. Uh, Bob Switzer, man, grateful for you. You have a podcast called The Epic Narrative, and you've already even given us a little hint as to some of the early ways in which you were doing that. You've pastored. Uh, you've uh, you've been a gypsy in most recent years, <laughs> uh, traveling, a, a wandering fellow who's uh, uh, awakened to the love of God and in mm, a glory. trust. I can't recommend the podcast enough. The epic narrative, 
Uh, I was listening to it this week. My wife and I clean offices uh, five nights a week, and and so it's an opportunity for me to get to know the next guest. And uh, Bob and I have actually had some conversations. He's easy to talk to. Um, thrilled you're here. Love the podcast. Share a little bit uh, right now about who you are, and let's get into it, man. Let's talk about the epic narrative. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Jason. I appreciate, you know, a man who uh, writes. I appreciate a man who... Uh, <laughs> loves uh, media started. that has his own production studio that uh you know has tell I, I honestly i'm i'm honored i really am i it, it blows my mind that i'm here blows my mind so thank you and uh Man. i appreciate your podcast and what you you've been doing uh for sure and i look forward to uh all the television shows and movies you're going to be putting out so Oh man, now you're letting people in on conversations we've had. I don't talk about that. <laughs> well, much no, I saw. It. I mean, Grace, Grace Gain, right? Grace. Uh, oh, oh, the the GAN network. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, let I'm... it be known. It's probably going to be out by the time this happens. But yeah, we'll have a um, a, a show on the GAN network. Actually, I'll say it here. Uh, if you aren't paying attention, we do the rethinking on GAN, and I'm co-hosting with Baxter Kruger, a particular show. That's uh, amazing. That's probably out by the time this happens if not uh you heard it here first <laughs> i'm telling it's you cool, no i man. just i just i just drew all that from when i saw that i was like dude this guy's got to be all over the place this is going to be amazing <laughs> it's a lot of fun man i love what you're doing tell us share a little bit uh I, I mean i can i can i can set you up if you'd like i know you're um you're i can roll a, don't worry roll, about it share a little bit about <laughs> it about, about yourself <laughs> all right so my my life uh for me i would say the lord the lord he's so good right he doesn't care where we start he just always invites us to more yeah and when i look back that's what i keep seeing is for whatever reason his gentle invitation always made sense to me and if you you know i, I give you all the details but basically i moved from ultra conservative cessationalists whatever that word is um, yeah sensational. dispensationalist uh -huh. uh, we're right everyone else is a little off and probably going to hell a lot of them are just going to hell because they we haven't told them about the gospel yet right but i was and i grew up in that and uh i got really good at it uh very you know i could i could make people come down the aisle i was i was good and i was young and i was passionate uh, but the invitation, you know, came to me through circumstances. Sorry, I, because I'm a storyteller, like I think, how many details do I give? Because we will be here all day. Uh, the invitation came through circumstances with a good friend and um, a book that looking back, probably you wouldn't guess would have invited me into more, uh, more, but it did. And what was the book? Uh, it was called The Grace Awakening by Charles Swindoll, who okay. I think at the time was like the president of Dallas Theological Seminary, which yeah. is like, <laughs> yeah, what? I love from all the ways that we are, the journey, though. I love, there's pieces all along the way. I love it. Good. There are. There yeah. really are. And every time the Lord invited me, it meant leaving where I was. Like, I, I read that book, and I realized there is n there is no grace in the in the world i'm in right now yeah not that i think they're going to hell i don't i think they love jesus yeah um i, I i'm sure they'll be in heaven i i, I am but of course because everybody gets there but that's <laughs> another whole thing <laughs> my will they be surprised but that's okay they'll still be happy because joy is all about heaven uh <laughs> So I knew I couldn't stay, so I, I had to leave that. And I went to like a very conservative church uh, as a youth pastor, and I was having a blast. Uh, but there was an invitation from the Lord there where where the the business of church was was bumming me out. And uh, yeah. anyways, invitation yeah. came. I took it. I went to a really small church where I was, where I was uh, much closer to my mom and dad. Uh, I was bivocational. I pumped gas, opened the convenience store, painted houses, and dealt with the dealt with the children, which for me was a blast because there were no kids in this church. There was, you know, everybody was like fifty five and older. Everybody, right. right? 
And they wanted me to start a youth group. So I did. And there was there was nowhere to go except literally the neighborhood. We were right. literally smack dab in a neighborhood. So I just started inviting these kids. And we would have, at, at, at its peak, we were probably 50, 60 children, all of whom walked there from the neighborhood. That's so cool. <laughs> right? So yeah. I have a conversation with the pastor. He calls me in and he's like, who are these people? And I was like, <laughs> they're, they're like, I, I could walk you down the street like i get introduced you to him all he's like well they're not coming on sunday so they're not paying your salary yeah business and, right church. and i sat there and i it's like your spirit just is like ick yeah that is not why i was doing this right you know and and he tried to give me a lesson in his own way of sure. listen you can't keep doing this if you're not if they're if you're not bringing people in to pay your salary then why why are you here yeah. So again, the Lord, Lord was like, "Hey, would you like to go for a walk?" <laughs> so uh, I left, left there. Wow. I left well, like it wasn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like these yeah. don't. I, I don't. I don't pick fights. A little, a little disillusioned, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Bummed out that that they were stuck there. Yeah. Because in my head, this is an easy fix. Like you come with me, I'll introduce you to all the parents. You invite them to Sunday morning. Yeah. And we'll have a church that, you know, we'll have a church of 200 people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It just made hey, what sense. If, what if their kids' lives are being changed? I bet that would impact the family. That might be intriguing. That would be intriguing. Yeah. What would you do if a child started loving Jesus? <laughs> <laughs> so you left there. Uh, left there. Uh, went, ended the up back. at the camp where I kind of, where you kind of started recording where yeah. I I really I was challenged by a friend. I don't know if you'll know this name. His name is Brad Cecil, but Brad and I have been friends for a long time. Brad was kind of on the front end of the leadership network with Doug Pageant. Uh Brad was a really good friend of his and I I met Doug through that um but at the time they were kind of radical, Mark Driscoll. Um they were they were like the cutting edge of youth ministry. So I'm I'm rolling into um you know into a youth camp. So I'm having these conversations with these guys. And one of the things that Brad asked me or challenged me, he goes, Bob, take your statement of faith, which at the time, right, every church had one. Some of them have them framed or carved into the wood or whatever. He was like, take that and, and cross out anything you don't have to believe to get to heaven. And I went from like 26 points to two. Okay. Right. Yeah. One was to believe in Jesus and the other one was to receive him as your savior, which I, I've also adjusted, but that's another, again, yeah. that's all yeah. part of the journey, right? So yeah. at the time I'm standing there going, wow, I, I don't believe in anything, but Jesus. <laughs> not that's a bad a, place, actually. Yeah, not a bad place to be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I start kind of reconstructing my whole preaching network at this youth camp. And I just start telling stories and and I'd made them last, you know, for the week. So every morning for an hour, I'd, I'd speak for a week. And it was a lot of fun. And I'd had a ton of growth there because my paycheck wasn't tied into my theology or the statement of faith, I believed. Yeah. And I really just focused, was able to just live off of loving God and loving people. Yeah. It was a I ton of fun. Yeah, I love. I'll, I'll interject for a sec because I, I, I think the that that simplification, that instruction that was given to you. Hey, what is the? I mean, the question, what what gets you to heaven? Uh, the premise is is, you know, I think we chuckle at that now because uh, we realize it's within us, or we've awakened to this union. But, but I love the simplification because for me, the the greatest shift in my life was was when I went. Oh, Jesus is perfect theology, which basically boiled everything down to the simplification that God looks like Jesus. Jesus mm. is what God looks like and what we look like. And then from there, you can you can rebuild and and uh, you're on solid ground. So I, I love that that a Mark Driscoll disciple helped you simplify um, <laughs> and boil it right down to Jesus. So you could actually do the repenting that leads to where we are today. Anyway, I just wanted to capture it. Yeah, I love it. I love how God is using all those pieces. And, and and this is this to me is just speaks to his faithfulness. It's like he does not care. Yeah. 
He yeah. doesn't care. He's like, I can use anyone. I don't yeah. care. I don't even care what their theology is. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's he That's is good. so good. He's just yeah. so good. Yeah. He's so good. So yes, Jesus is perfect theology. So that came at my next move. So eight years at the camp, uh, amazing. A new director was a set, was like assigned over the top of me and my boss, and he walked in and basically, to me, sounded like twenty years ago. And I was like, no, I can't, I cannot yeah. go back to this. Yeah. So we found a, uh, I found an amazing church, went to it. They were very at the time. I would for for an opportunity for label. So they were kind of way, a, you you found a bride, right? Is this? Have you already met your wife? Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, my wife. She was awesome. <laughs> That's another great story. Yes, I met her. She was all. We met at a, at a alt, very conservative fundamentalist Bible Institute in Scroon Lake, New York. Yeah, right. We went there. Okay. Uh, I saw her. I saw her like the third day of school, and <laughs> when I saw her, I thought, "Oh my word." If I, because I didn't say, oh, my God, back then, because that was, no, again, no, that, of course not. No, no. That, that was trouble. But that it was wasn't trouble. an oh, my God moment. I, I have it, a it really was. <laughs> like, deep inside, I said it, but I wouldn't say it, say it. Sure, you know, no, I, no, of course I had not. to hide that from the Holy Spirit because so that he wouldn't count it against me. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But I thought, <laughs> if I ever had a chance at a girl like that. Now, it, pure physical, obvious. I mean, I sure. didn't know her. But sure. in my head, it was like, oh, my word. Oh, my yeah, word. That's right. And uh, that's a long story. Not long. I just like to tell it. But, but well, it so, so, so she's with you at the youth camp at this point. Oh, my word. Yes. And she's actually with me on this whole journey. Yeah. And the Lord's taking her down different paths. And honestly, sometimes it looked like we were like, like she would, <laughs> she, she, asked, she would ask a question now. If you were looking, if you if you like the fivefold list, she's uh -huh. a teacher uh -huh. and I'm a pastor, uh -huh. right? So she's all about research and loves the truth, right? But the truth, the truth is adjusting, things are leaving, things are and she's like, I don't even know who Jesus is anymore. I don't even know what the use of the cross was. And I I remember sitting there thinking, that's a fair question. <laughs> but then I'm internally going, oh, my word, Bob, where are you? Like, you used to have answers for this question. <laughs> right, right. Oh, my gosh, dude. So many folks. Are, I mean, I get that question all the time. Well, that's the journey, right? It is. We were told it was about a God that looks away, and he's, and, 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 it, and it has something to do with a, sub, a penal substitutionary atonement. You start rethinking in the context of Jesus' perfect theology, and you eventually get back to the cross and go, I need to rethink, what is this about? Anyway, what is this about? Anyway, I, I, I like, here's what I like what's taking place here. You have a podcast called The Epic Narrative, and we're setting up the epic narrative with an epic narrative. So, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> <laughs> and as a storyteller, I love this stuff because uh, uh, it's all about the formative years for me. Uh, I think yeah. I told you. Before I hit record, I help people. I've helped people write their memoirs. I spend a lot of time on those formative years. I traumatize mm. them for days, pulling them through those formative years, so that we can get a sense of 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 how we got to where we are now. So, you leave the camp. I leave the camp, and that's where I first encount uh, encountered that word. Uh, Jesus is perfect theology. The church we went to was kind of. They were de they were connected with Bethel and with. Um, uh Toronto North Carolina um uh another oh, prophet. Morning, Star. morning Star Morning Star thank you yeah. mm -hmm. they were kind of connected with that <laughs> those Toronto. camps <laughs> oh yeah you would know <laughs> yeah so should. yeah so Jesus's perfect theology was something that would come up because at the time Bethel uh Bill that was kind of Bill's bell ringing uh phrase yeah that's right yeah uh so that was uh that was another invitation for the Lord to start you know, to keep, to basically keep pursuing him. That's really what he keeps inviting, right? There's yeah. more of me, Bob, there's more of me. And yeah. then other phrases came. It was kind of cool at the church because they, they were very teacher or they were teacher led. I mean, it was still a hierarchy, which if you listen to my podcast, I, 
I do get very passionate about the hierarchical mindset yep. and how that just destroys the family of God. But uh, I, I, people, my wife will listen and be like, you sound like you hate the church. And it's like, no, I don't. I actually really love the church. I would love to see it enter another dimension of a pro anyways. Yeah, I'm Another with you. Long story, but I could spend, I, 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 we could spend the rest of the time uh, discussing the, uh, the, right. the issues of hierarchy. Yeah, well, I think we can get there, but but uh, there's grace. I too, there is. yeah, yeah. So it's honestly why I'm still a gypsy after two years on the road is because I keep churches either want to recreate something that they've lost, which is something I'm not looking to recreate, or they want to maintain something, and you come in under whatever's whatever. You subjugate yourself to whatever they're trying to maintain, and yeah. it's like you know, I I could, I'm yeah. I'm really gifted, but I don't want to do this. I, yeah. I want to do something else. A great. I, so I wrote this book called "God Is Not in Control." Uh, the whole story is better than you think. Title's the scariest thing about it, but I spend some time in there. Um, you know, if you if you think of God in the context of a of a controlling sovereign then mm. you will establish uh, structures of hierarchy and you'll be justified to do so because you're serving a controlling sovereign. And and so I think structurally in the church today, and I spend some time, a couple of chapters highlighting that uh, and highlighting the, the master-slave paradigm then and the prison-like structure in which you actually place a, a leader as your warden and you participate in Come on. three meals and a cot. And and let him make the decisions for you. Let him go, be the go-between between between you and God, and you participate in hierarchies of exclusion. They become hierarchies of us and them, and uh, and of course they're traumatizing to people. They come. They they ultimately lead yeah. to church hurt. They lead to all kinds of fractures and schisms and splits. And for me, the 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 helping people perceive who he is as a as a as sovereign love that's how i juxtapose god is sovereign but his his sovereignty is revealed at a cross in the form of cruciform love where he lays his life down how did he, how did we end up winning in the end we won at the cross in christ uh, recon who reconciled the world to himself not counting our hierarchies against us not participating in the context of dualism <laughs> and, and so i'm with you man i could talk about hierarchy all Come day on. long i see the fractures and the brokenness and the trauma and i it's it's one of those places of deep passion if you ever want to see jason get angry it's when i see someone on a pulpit participating in the in the spirit of separation it drives me nuts, man. If you ever want to see, yeah, that's where I actually have to talk to my wife and say, um, hold me back from responding because right now I need to go braid a whip. Like I need to, like, I need, I need to take some time and go braid a whip, get a hold of myself. <laughs> I need to go penance. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I think we could we could spend some time there, man. Yeah, I know could. That. You and I yeah. could have a have a private convo. <laughs> that would be amazing. Yeah. So, so at that church, right? I start to get introduced to that. Not only is Jesus perfect theology, but but God is better than you think. Yeah. And uh, you know, some some of the speakers that came through, uh, they they had Steve Backlund there a number of times in Backlund. You know, very good about goodness. Yes. Um, Let's just and, laugh at that. I love Steve. That's yeah, his, but, yeah, yeah. Let's laugh. Yeah, at that. yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, um, you know, he's like, you know, if you have a a good thought about God, like he's even better. Think your best thought about God, he's even better. Yep. Amen. Right? And yep. then, uh, so I was there for about, I forget, five six years, and <laughs> what is still kind of a mystery to me. They, th I had a long meeting with my boss who invited me on behalf of the elders to find my next calling, which after two and a half hours felt like they fired me. But, <laughs> but to be fair, and honestly, yeah. this is the first, yeah. this was the first I'd ever, I'd ever experienced in conversations with anybody else who had in essence been asked to move on. They were like, you'll, we will pay you. Like you, you continue doing your job until you find the next place we just want you to go we want you to find your next place staying yeah. here long term isn't the isn't going to happen and they did for the next seven months uh yeah. till i found a place and yeah. i got to give them credit for it i just yeah. do 
Yeah, uh, I do. Yeah, man, and I know, um, you know, we I've talked about it here on, on a handful of occasions, never in depth, but you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll jokingly say we were passive aggressively um, um, asked to leave, you know, kicked out, or we were asked to leave is the phrase I would use. But in fairness, it it was my wife noted later we were getting small to stay we were we mm -hmm. were actually having to get smaller and smaller in order to stay and stay connected and they weren't wrong it, it was it was time for us to step away because they they had decided uh that they didn't want to go where we were where we were passionately awakening to and wanting to go and and it was it's tough but i i i appreciate the 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 honor and how they did that with you and and the, i do the, too the ability to recognize it as painful as it is yeah did you feel yeah. alone have you felt alone on this journey at all i'll tell you what what happens when you when you journey like this uh i don't know you you don't make long-term friends yeah uh right because what i've learned is that it, as a pastor so many of your friends are what i would call circumstantial in that you're their pastor and they open up and you walk with them through deep stuff and and sometimes really um yeah, some really ugly things, and yeah. you you think, wow, like that's really amazing, and I bet you we'll be friends forever on this. And then when you leave, it's like you you you're just like, oh, you're not my pastor anymore, so I don't talk to you anymore, which is not wrong. It just for me, that rhythm of life, I I find myself watching pastors who have been in ministry for 33 years at the same place. And I think I, I never had that. And my four children have no idea what that's like. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. but I can't, I can't re-engage at what in that hierarchical system again, I, I need a family. Yeah. And I, you and know, I don't yeah. know, I honestly don't know where to, where to look. <laughs> Because, <laughs> because churches that are, anyways, that's my journey. Let me. You want me to continue, or do you yeah, want to speak? Yeah. Well, I <laughs> no, I, I I asked about the loneliness because I I felt, and I can I can echo you with our kids uh, and all of the experiences they've had. Um, I think if there's anything we did well, we modeled authenticity. We modeled um, mm. looking and and being authentically hungry. Um, I think that's, you know, I grew up in the context of PKs being, um, pastor's kids being, uh, traditionally known as, uh, wildlings, you know, and having their prodigal years, you know, I never experienced that as a PK myself. And that I, 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 I commend my parents for being authentic in their pursuit of God. There was never a hypocrisy coming from the stage that didn't, uh, that didn't resonate. You know, my dad was as real from the stage as he was at home. Uh, and I, I think in that sense, we navigated that, but there was a, there was a deep loneliness. It's only been the last few years. Um, and I, and through this podcast, and I think the season we're stepping into as, as a church, I think, uh, I think there's been a lot of folks who have, have pioneered the goodness of God as Jesus revealed it in ways, uh, that, uh, were important in their own journey, just pioneering in, in the sense of pioneering for me, for my kids, uh, and I think we're in a season, though, where where God is bringing connection and heart to heart connection. But mm -hmm. I just asked about the loneliness because um, uh, we've experienced that. We for a long time felt very much alone. So I don't want to interrupt, though, because I no, 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 no. I appreciate that, and I would say, you know, in a specific way, the God's always been good. Imagine that uh, at, at giving me people that I could be uh, authentic with. But over the long term, not not many. So like, yeah, when we would leave uh, and go to the next place, like we did from there, we found a church uh, that was very kingdom. Like we kind of went from the Bethel mindset to like a all out kingdom. God can do anything. Like there's no ceiling here type of of mindset. I jump all in. That's my. That's kind of my personality, right? I'm, uh, and so people, I, they feel connected to me really easily. But I have found, just in realism, for me as a as a, uh, especially somebody who values relational connection, just intuitively understanding 
r relational impact regardless of decisions that are going on, I don't necessarily feel close to them, and that's okay. I used to think it had to. I had to have both. Like, well, if they're if they're if they feel really close, I, I I'm going to have to be their best friend. But that's not. Uh, right. So yeah, there's there's yeah. definitely uh, yeah. uh, times where I sit and think, wow, you you actually don't have any really like. Like, uh... <laughs> 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 here I sit. <laughs> you know, my wife sent me a, a reel yesterday, and we'll move on. The reel was um, a, a guy in his car, and he says, he says, have you ever seen this video? My wife sent me this video, and it's it's a guy comes in, he's got this shirt on, his wife's dressed him, and then his friend comes in, and he's got the same shirt on, you ever seen it? And yep. and his wife's dressed him, and they start laughing, and then his next friend comes in, and he's got the same shirt on, and then the friend after that comes in, and the friend after that, and the friend after that, and then he looks at the camera, and he goes, and I just got to ask, how does somebody at that age have so many friends? <laughs> <laughs> it's all emotional my wife sent it to me and i was like oh that resonates that resonates uh that's... oh thanks honey for pointing that out appreciate I feel that. that i got a, i got a small handful and i'm grateful for them but yeah, i think some of that's a pastor's journey too but um, i agree yeah i agree I think so. that's a pastor's journey i think true pastors do that for sure they feel that yeah yeah they feel that deep will i say Oh, oh, oh. Hey guys, interrupting for a second. Glad you're here. So thankful for this podcast. Thankful to get to do this with friends. Thankful for Derek and all of those who have navigated it with us. Listen, this podcast is done under our nonprofit, A Family Story. Twelve years ago, I had a vision and I wrote it down. I'm going to read it to you. Family Story is a relational community of creatives, family and friends. I see all of us as creatives. We do life together. We envision and express God's love through our gifting and grace. We are worshipers, dreamers, storytellers, and preachers, a family of dads and moms, brothers and sisters, daughters and sons, united by a passion to know and reveal God's perfect love. I feel like I'm seeing the fulfillment of some of that vision 12 years ago. Uh, the mandate on A Family Story was to create media content catalytic for an encounter with the love of God. A familystory.org is our website. I encourage you to go there. There's a whole lot of media content there. There's books and articles. Uh, there's films, some music, and uh, this podcast. That's the home of Rethinking God with Tacos, which is pretty dang cool. It's been life-giving, as I said, the community around it, the community of creatives, of family and friends that's growing. Uh, it's blown me away. And so... I'm thankful. I'm thankful uh, for all the relationships, connections, and I'm thankful for all those who've given. Rethinking God with Tacos is listener supported. If you'd like to support us, you can go to afamilystory.org. Uh, again, we're a nonprofit. And I would encourage you to join us on our Facebook group, uh, follow us on Instagram, all the socials. Uh, if you're curious how to find me on the socials, it's at Jason Clark is. Otherwise, like, share. Uh, write a review on iTunes or Spotify. Uh, tell your mom. We really are loving doing this, and I'm so thankful for everyone here. All right, it's time to get back to the podcast. It's it's yeah. So we end up at this uh, this final church, and this is where um, I start to. I start to personally pursue that that concept. I got introduced to people at this next church, uh, Randall Worley, um, uh, not Bill Johnson, uh, Bill Vanderbush, uh, Bill. Uh, Steve Backlin continued to come there. Another guy that was just so full of grace, it was ridiculous. His name was uh, Rudy Lowe. He's a South African guy, lives in Carolina. And then a uh, kind of a young guy didn't he doesn't necessarily he's not necessarily well known but his name's Tyler Johnson, and he wrote a book called How to Raise the Dead. But it, it, he's written others as well. But it it really is you raise the dead because you're passionate about God's love for life um, and His grace for people. Like that's, and he literally started dead raising teams all over the country. So I get to know these guys, and I'm like, okay, uh, I'm all in. I'm yeah. I am all in and I started to 
retrain my brain on how to how to apply and interact with scripture and then i started to go go to scriptures that were problem areas and be like all right you don't look good you just don't look good here um <laughs> and some of the you know some of the parables i'd be like mm, yeah this doesn't yeah. look good for you uh jesus <laughs> in the temple sure. right this is big yeah every 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 preacher that needs an angry God needed yep. Jesus to get pissed off somewhere. And boy, yep. the temple, two freaking they, verses. Yeah, they leverage and entire they leverage. theological stances are built off of it. Man, if in my younger years, I'd have said they leveraged the heck out of that. But now I'll tell you, they leveraged the hell out of that. They <laughs> loved it, right? So things like that. Now, I actually yeah. have a bonus episode, season one of the Epic Narrative. I think it's Come number on. 27, is on Jesus in the temple. Because every Easter, somebody's like make some comment about Jesus flipping tables and whipping people. And I'm like, ah, I'm done. I'm doing a bonus. I, I can't yep. stand it anymore. It takes about, <laughs> takes about 15 minutes of study, actual study. And you realize he had no, there was no, nothing that indicates anger in that story. Yeah. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. sorry. No, well, all right, we'll come back to it. Cause I, I, I spent some time on that. I, I, I love, I, I, my journey echoes yours in that, as I grew confident in Jesus's perfect theology and he's always good. And, and I'm not going to do mental gymnastics around the definition of the word good. It means good. It's literally not a sub, not subjective good. Like the taco tastes good, but like, no, Jesus cruciform love is good. I can count on it. Um, and then, and then from there, of course, I start going back and, and, uh, with the hermeneutic of the goodness of God, a hermeneutic of Jesus, Christocentric hermeneutic, and revisiting uh, these stories. But that's what you're doing. Go ahead, because you're setting up the epic narrative, which is what you're. Yeah, and the reason, by the way, it was a bonus episode is because you started at the beginning. You've started in Genesis, right? Well, season one is actually the life of David. Okay, and, that's right. And I picked that because when this was like a COVID project, right? So by the time I, we get to COVID, uh, there were some really good, really good people who know me really well. And they were like, they've been on me for years to start telling these Bible stories, recording them yeah. because nobody tells them like you. And I finally was like, all right. They were like, just start recording. Podcasting's easy. Just start recording. And I, I'm, I laugh now because I think you lying dogs, that is not true. <laughs> 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 but Especially I love them. Especially what you do, man, because you're 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 by yourself. You're really good at it, man. You're I love listening to you. you're easy to listen to, and uh, but also I know by the reason I waited years and years to do a podcast is because in my head I I thought it had to look like what you were doing, and there was no way I was going to pull off me by myself talking into a microphone. Uh, but you, it's really good. Um, you break down scripture. You break down. You, you found a format right that basically yeah. allows for you to naturally use your giftings and, and skill sets to tell it the story. It is a unique for format. It's, it, it is. And my producer has told me that, and he's a good friend of mine who volunteers all his time to it's put good. all that out. Honestly, I couldn't do it without him. He starts talking to me and I just think, oh my God, I don't, please don't what, ever, ever die. Name, if you die, yeah. I'm done. <laughs> what's his name? His name's Brian. Brian. <laughs> Brian Minerly. <laughs> he, I do. I tell him every every so often. He he makes a. I, I make comments to him while I'm while I'm talking. But yes, I do. I I, I talk alone. I talk alone. Uh, so uh, podcast. Oh, so I just start recording the life of David because I'm familiar with it, right? And I'd done like two weeks on it at at camp, and I really thought in my head I'm. It might take me 12 episodes. Right. It's, that's what I thought. Yes. And I start writing notes. So I'm, I'm pre-writing my episode notes. And I I am way past 12, right? So now I'm thinking, okay, maybe 25. <laughs> and now I don't, like, I don't even think he's king by number 25. <laughs> no, I, I'm not kidding you. So yeah. I start going on the internet. And I realize I have, as far as I can tell, I think we ended up with 60-something episodes on the life of David. It's pretty much First and Second Samuel. Uh, we don't skip a, a word of it. 
And by the time we're done, I think it's the longest recorded study on the life of David I can find anywhere. Oh, man. Beautiful. I, and and there were so many. It was it was fun for me because I was like, you, as a preacher, you never have time to talk about this. Yeah, yeah. Like you don't develop uh, like the story arc of, of um, Ahithophel, right? You kind of okay. mention him. Right. Because he's Bathsheba's grandfather, but but you know David describes him as somebody whose wisdom was the was like that of the voice of God. Wow! Like he's and he meets him, you know, in the caves. Yeah. Right. And then Ahithophel's uh, his son is is married and has Bathsheba. His son is one of the thirty mighty men of God, uh, mighty okay. men of David. Yeah. Right, and then Bathsheba marries Uriah, who's also one of the thirty mighty men of David. So her, so when he rapes Bathsheba, yeah, he kills Uriah. Yeah, Man. right. Both Uriah and her husband were they would die for David. Like that was the 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 level of commitment. I'm sure at some level in David's mind, he's thinking, I can kill Uriah because he's already he's already considered himself dead to whatever I want. So he yeah. kills him with. I don't I don't think it bothered him. No, he thought off. he's yeah, yeah. He's already committed this to me. Yeah, yeah. Right. And so, can I ask you this just real quick? And so, did you do a break off of um of church leadership based on the life of David? I'm just curious if you. <laughs> no, I mean I'm kidding. <laughs> you know how often we want to pull on David and go talk about his leadership, and we're going to build our structures on the on the leadership. I'm like. Good Lord, Jesus is what perfect ministry looks like, guys. Jesus <laughs> is the model. David, come on, uh, David. preach. Come on. Anyway, I'm sorry, excited. I just <laughs> no. But I'll tell you what does happen is is this the narrative allows yeah. people to ask questions without yeah. without their defenses up. So that's good. I, I love do that. go after things like hierarchical mindset yeah. because so yeah. much of the studies that I did and readings I did for the life of David were in these leadership groups. Who are like David did this, and I and I'm looking at the narrative, going, "What are you guys crazy?" Right, right. I, I'm right. sorry, like, yeah. And and uh so anyway, so you got Ahithophel, and then it makes sense to me why Ahithophel was the advisor of Absalom to overtake David. Like he, if you read it, Ahithophel was the driving force that put Absalom in the place of 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 taking over wow yeah and yeah. right so david sends in his double agents give this advice to absalom and when they when absalom it says ahithophel said go after david now while he's weak sure and the the double agents come in and they say no put to, wait put together a huge army crush david this will be the the sign to all the nations that you are and and absalom goes that's the one i like and it says at that point, Ahithophel leaves the 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 castle, the the castle, uh, the the leaves Jerusalem, and he goes home, puts his life in order, and kills himself because he, knows, he knew yeah. it was over. Yeah, he was he was the driving force. And the minute Absalom took somebody else's advice, he was like, "I can't. I'm so done." There was a root of obviously a, a reactionary root of bitterness in it. <sighs> Because of all of the aspects, all all that had taken place with his daughter and everything else, man, I, I you just, I didn't know that. I, what? I didn't know that, Bob. <laughs> I didn't know that. We should write a TV show. I'm telling you, David. <laughs> David's. It, it would. It would look something like, like The Sopranos and and Succession. Oh my gosh! Yeah. I'm yeah, telling you, I'd it watch is. That show. I'd watch. So it. that's why. That's why it took like sixty something hours to tell, and I had a blast. Wow. And then season two, I started with Genesis because uh, I purposely always found friends that didn't go to church and weren't a part of church. And generally, uh, I'd always run into one or two atheists, and eventually they'd find out what I did for a living, and then then we'd have really cool discussions because yeah. we were friends first. Yeah, that's huge. And they always came back to Genesis or to Exodus. And I was like, all right, then I got to, I got to, I got to, so, you know, uh, God, you look like a genocidal bipolar maniac at times. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm sorry. That's not good. Yeah. yeah. No matter how we slice it. So, yeah. 
uh, I'm happy to report he's always been good. <laughs> and uh, we've done some things wrong in how we portray him, but he's always been good. And the word of God is still the word of God. And he's always been good. And, and that is the epic narrative. It's the Cheers. epic narrative. I, I, I love it. I had uh, in, in the most intense part of, you know, I, I've often said on here, I, I, I didn't like the, the word deconstruction for a long time. And in some ways, still, it, it's, it's, a bit, it's, it's a bit crude of a word for, for the nature of how God actually is, because all things are being uh, constructed on the cornerstone that is Jesus. And the whole point is that we're building a life uh, that is transformative in nature and ourselves mm. and, the, and the world around us. But some stuff's got to get pulled down, obviously. There's a lot of uh, deconstruction in the process. And, and in the most intense uh, years, I actually stopped reading everything but the Gospels. And John was my favorite book. It was about two years. I didn't tell anyone because you're not allowed to do that as far as I knew. You know, um, the, the Bible is the Word of God. And how dare I? just reject part of God. And you know what I'm saying? Uh, so I, I did fear and trembling, but I, I had, was resetting my lens in hindsight. I can tell you it was, I was getting a Christocentric hermeneutic because eventually mm -hmm. I could go back and, and I love, I've, I listen to some of your podcasts and I, and I love that you're open about the fact that, Hey, there's a lens. We all have a lens. We all have a perspective through which we, we do all things, including our approach to scripture and, and you're forthright about your lens and the fact that that to me is authentic, mm. that you're able to say, hey, I do have a lens. Everyone does. If they're not telling you or if they're <laughs> pretending they don't have a lens, then they got no business uh, interpreting this in the first place because they're not even able to do a self-evaluation. They're not even being honest. Yeah, there's always a lens. Um, my lens is is the word who became flesh. Mm -hmm. Walter Moss went to a cross and reconciled the world to himself. It, it's where I found uh, where I found I can place my trust. It is a cornerstone upon which I can rebuild. And and I'm curious, uh, you can speak to any of that. But as you as you went into Genesis, I imagine there was a whole lot of John, the first chapter of John woven into how you approached it. Am I am I on base there a little bit? Because it seems like uh, there was a before uh, the foundations of the world <laughs> before uh for for me i was when i got into genesis the first i think the whole first episode is is on the word in the, <sighs> in the beginning right because it it means out from this place called the beginning yeah so everything existed <laughs> in this other place and it was like released into the cosmos and it pictured and and uh you know i i laugh because i used to i used to know exactly what genesis said you know and by the time i was done studying for the podcast i was like i have no idea what this what the first three chapters are about man there's so many ways to go about this uh which i also found really fun because i was like yeah. or it could mean this yeah. or so I, uh, I think liberty, I think that, though. Hey, Bob, like what a liberty. What a freedom. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. And what is one of the main qualities of love? <laughs> freedom. I think it's freedom. I, I think, think so. A great question. I think so. It's almost <laughs> like God's love. And he wants you to like constantly be thinking about him and rethinking about him it's like almost like that's what theology was supposed to be come on a rethinking of god like alongside tacos i remember this one time i was in guatemala yeah <laughs> come on on a missus trip sorry this is my taco story you like how hey, i did that? It, it, it's all right let's do it it's natural <laughs> i like the flow <laughs> i was in guatemala on a missus trip we were working at a huge mission organization orphanage senior citizen home all this stuff and i walked out back and i'm see these two two women making talk making the tacos they're just uh -huh. they're like they're grabbing the dough and they're, they're tortillas, slapping it yeah. a few times they're whipping it down on this metal bowl looking thing over an open flame Come and on. and they're you know their fingers are fried so they're just grabbing it hot flipping it and i'm like oh my word this is amazing i'm watching them. and uh <laughs> they're smiling because 
of course, that's all we can do because we don't. I don't speak sure. Spanish at all. Tortilla. But I do speak when I'm. This is embarrassing, but it's true. I when I'm around Spanish people, I speak English like Spanish is my first language. So I start to stutter. I have an accent. My it drives my wife crazy. She's like, "You you speak English," and I'm like. Do I know empathy? It's empathy. You're it trying is. to. How do we <laughs> I, here? I actually found out somebody once told me that like people who do that intuitively, there's actually a name for it and they can't help themselves. So I say right. yeah, I'm medically conditioned for this. But, <laughs> <laughs> but they That's gave all. me, you know, I somehow asked if I could help, you know, and they yeah. so they give me this ball of dough and I can't get the thing off my I'm like it's like stick in and I'm a I finally like peel it off and throw it in the bowl. And then of course they, you know, I flip it and I'm all excited and they just are cracking up the whole time. We're having a great time. And right, I don't know right. how, they, still to this day, I don't know how they did this. They had nothing on their hands. They just whip it down, flip it over. They'd made like 300 of a meal. It was, it was, a, it was crazy. So I got to eat that taco because I made it. And uh, sure. <laughs> it, there is something amazing about fresh <laughs> out of the out of, off the pan well, tacos if we're doing it what was the meat then what were what were you doing was it beans or where did oh, you have uh well that these would i don't know what i had in that one i mean i just ate the ate the taco because i made it but yeah 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 it was just up you know they would send it up to the kitchen and then we would have whatever meats were available for lunch uh -huh. Uh -huh. no you no now i would another time another crazy <laughs> taco story okay it's not crazy it's just my story uh yeah. <laughs> I I became friends on Facebook only with a guy who was the brother of somebody I went to was going to church with and that this guy lived in Maui and I find out through his brother that every year he leaves this this guy who lives in Maui leaves for 2 weeks and goes to a conference because of work and needs someone to watch his house and I'm like well heck I'll watch I'll watch his house yeah. Yeah. so out of nowhere I get a message and and this guy uh frank he's like uh this is when i'm leaving can you be here so out of nowhere my wife and i yeah got two weeks in maui come on at this house What's we got to name? drive his convertible anywhere we wanted on the island wow so he told us you know we were like where should we go so we had to watch his dogs as well but uh he told us about this taco place right down the street right so we go there one day and we order the fish tacos and I, you, there's nothing, I've never had anything like it. Yeah. I, yeah. I was, I was sticker shocked. I knew things were expensive in Maui, but like for two fish tacos, I think it was like almost $20 a piece for yeah. each of us. Like it was almost a $40. I was probably a hundred dollars now, but, right. but I, I, I was like, Oh my word. Right. Then I ate them and guess there where we went up. to lunch the next day <laughs> for tacos, same place. I was like, I, it's worth it. <laughs> they they were worth every dollar. Oh, I get it. Unbelievable. Un well, and, and then add to that the 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 nature of of how you found them because I mean you can't you can't take away the whole experience there. No. You're in the the favor of God, the trip to Maui. I mean, what's his name? Just send me his number. I'm just curious if he needs any <laughs> I, no, 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 I, no. He's my friend. <laughs> your friend. Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. But I, uh, you and I, I are not that close yet, Jason. <laughs> you don't want to share your favor with? Uh, all right, I, uh, no, I, I was in uh, Austin. I'll exchange uh, favor. You give no. I'm like... <laughs> I was in Austin uh, a few years back and was there for three days. Had a taco the first day around the corner from my hotel. I ate there every day for lunch. And I was like, I'm sure there's other taco, but if you find a spot, it's like, hey, I, I don't, nope. I'm not risking getting it wrong. This is, yeah. So I totally get that. I respect totally. that. <laughs> and then I want to do a shout out because I got all excited. You know, I love telling stories, but uh, my son-in-law was a self-made chef and uh, just an amazing, amazing young man. He's uh, then he put his he put himself through coding school. He's now an amazing coder, but. He and his and my daughter were living with us for a couple of years, and he would go into these modes of cooking, and he was going to make the the you know the family dinner. Everybody was yeah. coming over, yeah. and he said, "I'm making tacos." And I thought, uh, "Well, all right, family <laughs> meal." I'm thinking, you know, ground beef and um, 
shell you buy it. Crunchy shells and uh, maybe, you know, maybe some uh, seasoning from Taco Bell or something. I don't know. Right, right. Right. Not even close. Like he, this guy, I, he put, he, he, he braised something in, you know, in wine sauce. He, he had pickled this in cilantro and I don't even like cilantro. Okay, I, I'm one of those 25% people where it uh, tastes like soap. Tastes like yeah. soap yeah. Uh -huh. No, this guy made his made homemade fresh uh, picante. Oh my word! So the whole family, like we wipe him out. Uh -huh. It was so good. And then both my wife and I are like, "Hey, uh, we'd like to invite several people over for dinner. Could you make those tacos again? again. Yeah, because there's nothing like a good one. Yeah, no. Uh, hey, what's his name? We got this. His name. I will tell you. <laughs> His name is Mitch McEwen, and he lives in Keller, Texas. If you're ever down there, reach out to me, thebobswitzer.com. <laughs> thebobswitzer at gmail.com, either one. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love the uh, the the way in which we've conversed, bro. Uh, it's so easy. It's You're a storyteller. Um, I love I gotta, I gotta come back to epic narrative and ask you. I, I, I um, I'm convinced God is love, and because I'm convinced God is love, I'm convinced. I, I, I tell the story often, so I'll tell it quick here. You know, the the day that I had a conversation with my youngest, we all play the game. I love you to the trees and back. She says to the adds adds says that and adds to it to, uh, to um the sun, the moon, the stars, and then I add to infinity, and she adds and to beyond, and then. I add something to that. And then on the end of that, she says, all clever, like, I, you know, I give a stream of the litany of my love and she all clever, like she says, times two, daddy. And when she, when she says times two, my heart explodes because I realize that this is what love is. That the moment mm -hmm. you think you got your arms around it, it's times two. You know, your, your kid can blow it up with their smallest multiplier that they know. And, and, and to me, that is story. That is the epic narrative that we're in. It, it started before the beginning and it continues after the end. It's everything in between. And, and it, is a, it is a story in which all things are being reconciled and restored. And uh, I, I feel that when you talk, I feel that on your podcast. I love the name of it, the epic narrative. I think it's, it's a part of every one of us. We're all in this. We have a phrase here, love is the long game or family is the long game. I, I feel like you're helping people perceive the long game of God and our place in it, our, our, the fact that, that everything in my life has led to this conversation right now. Like mm -hmm. This is significant in this moment. And, and, and how do you live in this moment knowing that we're a part of this eternal moment? Like This is eternity right now. Am I scratching the surface of what it is on your heart that you're wanting to do there? Wow. Oh. Like I, everything about our conversation, uh, reaches to my heart. It's it. And, and, you know, this comes from, I know we, we spoke whatever a month and a half ago. Yeah. And I thought I like, I wanted to call you every other day. <laughs> I love that conversation too. <laughs> just cause I was like, I just like, I just, yeah, no, I yeah. feel, I feel the same. I do. You know, the love of God that, we can't express it enough. Yeah. There can't be enough avenues through which people get to experience it. And, you know, you have your podcast and your, um, uh, family, family stories, River, uh, Riverside family. Yeah. Family story. Yep. And you're going to continue to develop more. And I think that's awesome. I have the yep. epic narrative. Yeah. Uh, it's, uh, we just the family just keeps talking about how awesome their dad is. That's it. That's, that's it, man. That's I mean, you said it at the very front end. I think Steve Backland uh, had a, had some language. I, I often say on this podcast, it, it, my heart is um, to have a conversation where we get to the burning, which was easy with you. We were right. We started off at the burning. You know that Emmaus Road awakening that is is heart first, but it in, includes it's holistic, includes everything. But it's it's didn't our hearts burn right? Like let's get to the burning, and then and then how do we have a better thought about who he is today than our last best thought about him? Um, I, and I, I appreciate 
this is what I mean by that when I asked about the loneliness, because I, I feel like there's more and more connections mm -hmm. in my life, you know, the Bob, the Bob Switzers of the world that have been navigating roads on their own uh, uh, for years. And yet for such a time as this, uh, you're putting language to the goodness of God that invites people into this eternal life journey, this, uh, this immediate now. And, and I'm thankful for it, man. And, and, and honored to have had, had this connection. We'll do it again. Um, but uh, yeah, I wanted to tell you about Balaam, but we'll have to do it again. Well, come on. We got, look at, look at, we're at 58 minutes. Like there's no law, there's no rules. Like, uh, do it and then and then uh, and then oh he's trying to uh, we'll, how let, long it we'll let the editor we'll let the editor decide what to do well that's me so that's to be kind to me now be kind because I... <laughs> I, I so we're doing exodus which is another that's current season right uh yeah. is exodus which is another place where you get to talk about leadership a lot because people love moses as the dominating top of a pyramid who oversees all things so you get to really go after the hierarchy with him. But yeah. I'm also writing for season four and I come up against Balaam, the story of Balaam. And one of the things that I, that I, like blew my mind is I'm writing, I'm reading uh, the oral sages and they mentioned Balaam. And in their writing, they say, Balaam was a prophet of God who was uh, that because God always had a prophet available to the nations while Israel was in Egypt. Mm. And I was like, wait, this is, that's a fabulous question. How do yeah. we, he's a prophet of God. Where did he come from? Right. Where was he trained? How, how did he get there? And yeah. how do all the nations know where to find him? Right. Because he, he is a prophet. Of, like he's known as a prophet of God. He, and people know that his prophecies come true. Right. Right. Which is another whole, like, wait a minute. So God is busy in the nations of the world while Israel's in Egypt, which to me is an awesome thing about God's goodness. That's amazing. Now, he's also known to be a negative prophet, which, again, is... Sure. Right? He's, and I know you guys have been doing a ton on prophecy, and yeah. you, know, yeah. you can, you can yeah. speak the gold, or you can speak about the dirt you went through to get there. But, That's right. So Balaam was really good about bringing the negative and destroying people. So he's known for this. He's also known for a negotiation because every time the king sent him somebody, he sent him back with, no, I can't do that. And they would send more riches and more important people the next time. And he did this three or four times. And that's what he was. That was his reputation. Okay. When you All finally right. send me enough money, I will go prophesy what God wants to do with these people. This is crazy to me, right? Yeah. So finally, God relents, gives him permission, says, listen, you can go if you want to go. I'm not stopping you. Like, yeah, I know some churches, by the way, that operate that way. Oh, but, well. Anyway, sorry. Come on, just... preach, Jason. Come on. Yeah. Lay out some names, <laughs> I love Jason. Sure. I Lay love out the sure. receipts, there's Jason. A Let's... Model. There's, a, there's Let's... some Balaam models out there, I think. <laughs> <laughs> the Balaam community. Uh, yeah. but what he really, what really hit me was the dualism, the picture of dualism in this, in this story, in that you have people who love the fact that, you know, the, they, the talk about him being the prophet of God. They don't, they don't talk about where he came from or why he was known to be the prophet of God, but uh, while Israel was somewhere else, but he, he, he gets permission to go and his donkey you know, sees the angel and wanders off yeah, and yeah, yeah. Balaam beats him. And then he da, 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 right. Finally he lays down donkey talks and everybody's like, see, if God can use a donkey, God can use you. That's all I and know about I, Balaam. <laughs> I think to myself, while I'm reading this, where do people think this angel of death came from? Hmm. God has a prophet. God is good. And we're all about that. He, yeah. and he warns Balaam about about an angel of death that god sends god right. sends an angel of death to speak to to kill his prophet who who is going on a journey that god said he could go on like what and then god why, saves why, his donkey. right right what, what kind of god does that what kind of dad yeah. would say okay yeah. you have permission to go to the mall but i'm going to try and i'm going to send out a sniper who you're not going to know about right and I'm going to try and kill you on your way there, even though I gave you permission to go. Right. Yeah. 
you've got so many theological gymnastics to pull that off. That's right. Yeah. Or you yeah. just say the angel of death came from the father of death, which wasn't God. Come on. And God, I, God was like, hey, donkey, you're going to have to talk to him because he's not paying attention to what's around. <laughs> right. Man. Oh, my gosh. I love that. I love that. I love this stuff, man. That's the <laughs> the way to. So I'll, I'll, I'll wrap it up in this sense. I I stopped reading scripture except for the Gospels for two years. And then when I went back into the Old Testament, I went back in with Jesus, perfect theology. Mm. I didn't have even the language at the time. I just knew that uh, that he was uh, my lens and I would look at all things through him. And, and if I found something and I couldn't, you know, for a long time, I, I can actually speak to Job now, but for a long time, I would read Job. And the best I could do was Job's the question. Jesus is the answer. I'll live in the I don't know, but God is good as Jesus revealed. And I'd rather be pl place my foundational understanding on the goodness of God than have to do men or as Jesus revealed and have to do mental gymnastics around the goodness of God. So I can so I can somehow read Job through some deterministic lens. And now I'm you know, what I'm saying I would rather Jesus be my savior than Job's idea of who God is. And so what it did was it gave me liberty and eventually. Uh, you read guys and you, you come into contact with you guys and I, but on my own for a long time, I realized what I was doing was discovering that God let his kids tell the story as Pete N says it, God, God let his kids interpret what he was like in the old Testament. And Jesus came along and said, you have heard it said, but I say, and he reset our lens. He gave us this, this greater love perspective. And, and there's where the liberty lies then to go back and discover these great discoveries. If, if, if God is a God of resurrection life, then the angel wasn't sent from God. It was interpreted that way. But Jesus is what God has, uh, has to say about himself. Absolutely. And it's so beautiful. There's so much liberty there. Now you can approach scripture and you're not having to do, having to wrestle these great insecurities uh, of, of, uh, of, a, of a God confusing it you know i i, I broke down uh, uh abraham and isaac and it's the same thing it's like uh god wants to test abraham by by <laughs> by um seeing whether or not he'll he'll buy into a god who demands child sacrifice like what a depraved and broken uh story that i have to now instead of what if it's god invited De abraham into the cultural delusion of his day so he could set him free from it so Come that his on. generations afterwards didn't have to live under the bs lie that god somehow requires that you kill your kid to prove your devotion and no, why would isaac lay down why would isaac lay down unless he was told all his life eventually son the lord's going to require you because because every yeah. god every god requires a firstborn son yeah, that's right yeah. And Isaac was like, all right, my time is now. And imagine living under that delusion, trying to trust that. By faith, Abram believed God would raise him from the dead, which means on the way up the mountain, when he said, we'll be back, we're going up to worship, we'll be back. He was believing in a God. It was this, I don't know, but he's good. He was believing that God was better than his best last thought about him. Come and on. That's why, he's, that's why he's the father of our faith. Not because he was willing to kill his son, but because he didn't know any better and trusted that God would raise him from the dead in the context of his delusion. Like, and the liberty then to go read scripture in pursuit of a God who doesn't send death angels, but a God who actually will speak through the donkey to save you from the death angel. There's so much liberty there. So much. So much. And and come on, man. That's why I, I'm, I'm thrilled about what you're doing. I'm thrilled about all the voices that are giving us language and permission and early church fathers who, who 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 read scripture this way and 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 eastern orthodox and the understanding that the idea of scripture being this inerrant absolute um um literal interpret th is five five hundred years old not even that sometimes it goes back 60 and 70 years anyway Anyway, I, I'm excited. You got me preaching. You got me preaching. <laughs> I'm so excited. I'm excited that you're excited. <laughs> <laughs> so much liberty. So much life, man. So it's much beautiful. joy. So much joy. Yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad that you're doing this. I know that, uh, and I'll and I'll just bl bless you, man. I know right now you're in a season of faith. That this is um, a project uh, of love. That you have. This is your best yes in this season. I pray provision and continued grace 
um, favor as 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 God increases your tent pegs, and and, um, and 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 connection and community and life and some clarity. I know we talked about that on the front end. Um, how do people find you? Dun, dun, dun. Well, uh, the you know my my the best way is uh, I have a website called thebobswitzer.com. I have an email called thebobswitzer at gmail.com. Good. And those are probably the two best ways. I'm on yep. Facebook. It's a public page. Easy to find me there. I'm on Instagram under Dad Switzer because I'm a father and that's my last yeah. name. <laughs> Love yeah, it. that's yeah, about love it. it. And the podcast is the Epic Narrative, and it's the everywhere. Epic Narrative, podcasts, you know, everywhere podcasts play Spotify, iTunes. Are you on Google. YouTube yet? Have I what? Are you on YouTube yet? I am not. Okay, uh, right. I am not. It's one of those uh, technological things. I just I haven't had the. Yep, I get it. Yeah. Yep. No, it's uh, it's good. So everywhere, everywhere uh, podcasts play, and and uh, man. Uh, we're going to find other ways to connect. I appreciate you. We'll get some more phone calls in. and, and uh, I would love you. that. Yeah. <laughs> honored, honored to do this. Glad that we could do this. And uh, looking forward to the next time we connect, bro. All right. Thank you, man. Hey, guys. Thanks for listening to the podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast, myself or our guests, you can go to afamilystory.org. You can also go to afamilystory.org. Uh, if you'd like to give, this is a listener supported podcast and we are incredibly grateful for your generosity. Hey, we have a Facebook group and it's pretty cool. Uh, Rethinking God with tacos. You can join us over there. Lots of incredible conversation and community taking place on that page. And you can also follow us on all the socials, Instagram, uh, TikTok, YouTube, and others. Hey, I'd love it also if you uh, went on iTunes and left a review or shared or tweeted or liked the podcast. Uh, let your friends know that this is a good place to hear about the love of God. I pray grace and wonder over your day.